This is Kay Rudolph. The focus of this presentation is to help you begin to make sense of the autosomal DNA match results that you get back from your ancestry test result or your family tree DNA or your 23andMe or that you look at from the GEDmatch website. The autosomal DNA consists of the 23 pairs of chromosomes in the nucleus of our cells. These are 22 matched pairs where one of a pair comes from the mother and one of the pair comes from the father and one unmatched pair, the sex chromosome. We inherit an X chromosome from our mother. If we also inherit an X chromosome from our father so that we have two X's, then the child that results is female. If the father if the father's sperm contains the Y chromosome instead of an X, then the child that results will be a male. Well, we inherit exactly half of our DNA from our mother and half from our father, and they in turn inherited half from each of their parents. That is not to say that we're going to inherit exactly 25% of each of our grandparents. Why is it that we don't get exactly 25% of our DNA from our paternal, from each of our paternal grandparents? The reason has to do with recombination. And that is that in those 22 chromosomes that are not the sex chromosome, each parent has a pair that they received from their parents. So this, for example, would be your father's chromosome one. Your father has one pair of his chromosome one came from his mother and one pair of his chromosome one came from his father. In the process of forming the sperm cell, these two chromosomes that form the pair line up and recombine, trade parts of each other so that the chromosome 1 that is sent off in the sperm cell to fertilize the egg is some combination of both those chromosomes received from the uh, father's mother and the father's father. So you're going to have, yes, 50% from your father, but you may have 20% from your paternal grandfather and 30% from your paternal grandmother. In other words, what you're getting is some mixture of these earlier generations. And each generation, this recombination occurs. So you want to liken it to essentially a bowl of stew. When your father dishes out to the sperm cell that forms you, you get a scoop of the DNA that he received from his parents. You do not get an exactly proportional amount of each one of these earlier ancestors. And so as you see, as you go back in time, you'll have a smaller and smaller percentage on average from each ancestor there will be a time when mathematically there just are not enough genes to include some from every one of your ancestors. So you see here in our illustration of the uh, spoonful of stew that the ancestor that contributed the potatoes has not been passed down at all. So what do your DNA results look like? Well, if you look at the raw file, it's going to look something like this. You'll have the chromosome, the identification name for a, a marker at a particular point, and then you're going to have two alleles. Because you had two uh, chromosomes of chromosome 1, you're going to get two readings for that position. 
but the test is not able to describe which chromosome your mother's or your father's contains any one allele. So remember, you get a long string from your parents, and each of your parents is a distinct, distinct string. But when that is uh, tabulated through the test, it is not possible to attribute a particular allele at a particular point to a specific parent that provided that allele. So we end up having a bit of a problem. And this uh, graphic from DNA GEDCOM illustrates that. The test is going to say, all right, looking at your chromosomes uh, results, you have two G's at this particular point. So you're looking to see, is there, or the computer doing the analysis is looking to see, in the person you're matching, is there a G? And yes, it finds one. So it says that's a match. Then it goes to the next position, and we've got a G and an A. Do you have a G and an A down here? Yes, so it calls that a match. And it goes to the third. Do we have a T or a C? And it finds yes, we have a T. So it calls that a match. And it keeps going through. So you can see that it is suggesting that there is this very long match. But in fact, that match is jumping back and forth between the chromosomes you receive from your mother and those you receive from your father. The actual match where there is a chromosome to chromosome match is actually much smaller. So what do relationships themselves look like? Well, first, the unit that we use to measure relationship is the centimorgan. And I'm not going to go into detail on what that is, but just keep in mind that the more centimorgans you share with someone, the closer is your relationship. Uh, this chart here was produced by Blaine Bettinger, the genetic genealogist. He did a study where he solicited uh, input from people who had been tested, had their DNA tested, and whose relationships with each other were documented. They knew there were siblings, they knew there were cousins or second cousins. And so he looked at the distribution of the relationship results. You can see that they tend to follow your fairly normal bell curve shape. Uh, note the more distant relationships tend to overlap more. From this, he created a very useful chart that gives you the expected centimorgans shared and the distribution that he discovered empirically from the test results that were submitted to him and the average of those uh, distributions. So let's take a look first at a relationship between a son and his mother. The son has 6,800 centimorgans, about 3,400 coming from each parent. And this is what you would see if you looked at the chromosome matcher on GEDmatch. It is showing that we have uh, the blue stands for matching segments longer than seven centimorgans, that is statistically significant matches. So there is an entire match across every chromosome. Well, that's to be expected because, as you recall, the test is just looking, do you have at least one of the amino acids that are at a particular position on one of the matching person's chromosomes. And since you got one entire chromosome from your mother, 
you're definitely going to match every single one uh, of your chromosomes with one of hers. Now, the green stands for full base uh, base pairs with full match, and that would mean that you match both the mother's chromosome and the father's chromosome. The yellow is base pairs with half match, meaning that you match one chromosome, and that would be expected. So when we look at the uh, chromosome browser on Family Tree DNA, and here we're comparing Pat with her two sons, Louie and Davis, uh, Louie and Jean. You can see that, yes, she is a complete match with both of her sons. But now let's take a look at the two brothers compared to each other. And you can see here that they do have very strong matches, but there are long segments where there is not a match. So we're looking at Jean here. The orange is segments that he has in common with his brother and the dark are the segments that he does not have in common where he got a different scoop of the stew than his brother did. When we look at the numbers on the Family Finder match screen you can see that Jean matching his mother at 3,384 centimorgans. That is half of the 6,800 that he has himself. Whereas with Louis, he's got about half of a match, but it's not quite as precise. The other thing that you're going to want to look at is the length of the longest block. And that indicates how close the relationship is. You can see that as you get uh, further away in a relationship, the shared um, DNA is reduced and the length of that longest shared block is reduced. So now we're looking at Gene and comparing him to his two aunts. And he has a match to his Aunt Fran of a little over 1,700, a match to his Aunt Mary of just a little over 1,300. Now let's take a look at the chromosome match. Uh, the chromosome browser on Family Tree DNA. You can see the uh, gene is being matched to his two aunts, and so you can see where he is matching each of them in very different parts of their uh, DNA. Each of these represents one of the chromosomes. Now let's take a look at first cousins. On the data that Blaine had collected, he found a range of first cousins matching from as little as 83 centimorgans to as much as 1,559 centimorgans, with the average from the results that he'd collected of 881 centimorgans. The calculated amount would be about 850 centimorgans. So 850, his uh, empirical data shows very close to that. And you can see a very wide range in actual results for individuals who are indeed first cousins. So here we're looking at uh, Jean with his cousin Heather and they only match on 754 centimorgans. Significantly less than the 850, but they are most definitely first cousins. And this is what it looks like when we look at the chromosome browser. 
where Gene is matching Heather. You can see that on chromosome 6, they no longer match at all. On several chromosomes, they're only matching on one significant uh, segment. So you can see that as the recombination is going through generation after generation, you are going to start losing uh, ancestors from your DNA. Let's take a look at a great uncle, a uh, great aunt compared to a test person. Uh, Blaine's chart shows that he would uh, expect it to be around 12.5% or around 850 centimorgans. What he found in the results was uh, some cases were as uh, say the matching segments were as short as 236 centimorgans and in uh, some cases as much as 1300 centimorgans and that average being around what we would expect 840. So we can see here looking uh, Gene matching to his great aunt Jewel. She matches him at 521 centimorgans. And when we look at the chromosome browser, we can see that we have now uh, no match at all on chromosome 7, no match on chromosome 10, 12, 13. So the more distant the relationship is, you're going to see fewer chromosomes that match for shorter segments. As you get further out into the uh, more distant cousins, you see that it becomes very difficult really to tell them apart. Uh, here we have a third cousin that could have anything from zero DNA match to 334 centimorgans. Um, second cousin, uh, twice removed. Here we can have, so the difference really between a third cousin, a third cousin twice removed, it becomes very difficult to say that with any confidence just looking at the numbers. And so here we're looking at gene compared to a more distant cousin and uh, they match on 99 centimorgans. The longest match on any chromosome is 19 centimorgans. And you can see here that they are, they have a match on the X chromosome. And that's going to suggest that since Gene has, he's male, so he has the X chromosome that he has, he got from his mother because he received a Y chromosome from his father. That suggests that Beverly Allen is matching Gene on his mother's side of the family. And when we look at uh, Beverly's family tree, we can find the match because we have documented these relationships. And the match is with the Rudder family. Beverly's grandmother, Mary Rudder, is uh, close, is in the family line from which Jean descends. And when we look at Jean, Douglas E. Davis Jr. He is descended from Sally Rudder, who is the daughter of William Henry Rudder and Martha K. White. And we're going to explore that and see how that relationship matches. So the DNA by itself is not going to tell you where the relationship is. It's going to tell you where in your tree you want to be looking for that relationship. And so it's going to tell you if it should be likely to be on your mother or your father's side. 
and it's going to tell you about how many generations back you should look. So here we have the 1880 census for William Rudder, and in his household he has his daughter Mary and his daughter Sally. Mary would ultimately become the grandmother of Beverly, and Sally would become the great-grandmother of Jean. Here we have the family tree for William Rudder and Martha Wright, showing the two daughters, Mary and Sally. Mary became the ancestor of Beverly, and Sally became the ancestor of Jean. Now, here we have a summary of how those relationships are reflected in the percent of shared DNA. Let me walk you through that on the tree so you can see how that works. As you climb the family tree, as you move from one level to the next, you have a halving of the shared DNA. So Beverly gained half her DNA from her mother, Allie. And half of that came from Allie's mother, Mary. Siblings share about half of their DNA. So half of that 25% that Beverly has would be shared with Sally, 12.5%. Sally uh, shares with Doc. Doc receives half of his DNA from his mother. So Doc would have a match of six and a quarter percent shared DNA to Beverly. Minnie received half her DNA from Doc. And so she would share three and a quarter percent of her DNA with her cousin Beverly. As you can see there, second cousins have five degrees of separation, one, two, three, four, five, for a shared DNA of three and a quarter percent. Pat got half of her DNA from her mother, Minnie. So where Minnie matched three and an eighth, Pat is going to match half of that. And Gene got half of his DNA from his mother, so he is going to match 0.782% with Beverly. So 0.7815% of 6,800 centimorgans would be about 53 centimorgans. So we would expect to see a match between Jean and Beverly of around 53 centimorgans. But again, you want to remember that there's recombination, that scoop of the stew, and so you're going to see some flexibility in the actual numbers. And so here we have Jean, and he matches Beverly at 99 centimorgans. So he got a little bit more stew in common with Beverly than, um, than the average. The X match, again, indicating that the relationship is on his mother's side of the family. That X DNA coming from his mother, Pat. Let's take a look at how that works. So we're looking at the travels of the X DNA. Here is William Rudder. He has an X chromosome and a Y chromosome. That's what makes him a father. Martha has an X chromosome and an X chromosome. She has two X's. That's what makes her a mother. She gives a scoop of stew to her children of a recombination of her exes. So her exes are going to be a combination of the two exes that she received, one from her mother and one from her father. 
William is going to pass on the X that he received from his mother intact to both his daughters. There is no stew recombination. Now, Mary is going to pass a combination of her exes to her daughter Allie. So a combination that includes William's ex and the two exes from Martha. The other ex she is getting from her father. And finally, she is going to pass a combination of that ex that she got from her father plus the ex that she got from her mother, which was a combination of the exes from William Rudder and Martha White. So you can see in purple, this X traces back to both William and Martha. And Beverly's other X chromosome comes from her father. Now on this side of the family, we have Sally uh, passing on a combination of her exes to her son Doc. And this X here then is going to be a combination of the X from William and the X melange that Sally received from her mother Martha. Doc received a Y chromosome from his father. Now, Doc is going to pass on his X chromo chromosome intact to his daughter Minnie. There is not going to be any mixing. It's going to be exactly the X that he received from Sally, which included the combination from William and from Martha White. The other X Minnie received from her mother. Now Pat, she receives from her mother Minnie a combination of Minnie's X from Minnie's mother and that X that came from Doc which was a combination from Sally which included both William and that uh, melange from Martha. Pat's second ex came from her father, and finally she passed on to her sons Louis and Jean that combination of uh, her two exes. So you can see both of these are having exes that get back to William Rudder and Martha White. Now here we're looking at Gene and we're comparing him to Beverly again, that's the orange, and we're also comparing him to his great aunt Jewel. Now these are both related to Gene on his mother's side of the family. You know that because they are both matching him on the X. But you notice while they're matching him, they're not matching each other on the X. And the reason you can see here, here we have William Henry Rudder, who is the ancestor of uh, Beverly and Jean through the um, Odom Alford line. And Jewel is uh, Louis Franklin's sister and so she is matching Jean on his mother's paternal side. Now we're going to talk about one that's a little bit trickier and I don't actually have an answer to this one but it is eye-opening in a number of respects. This is a match between my uncle David Harrigan and Christina. 
They share a total of 61 centimorgans, with the longest block being 17 centimorgans. And so the estimated relationship is uh, second to fourth cousin. There are a number of names that look promising, Hewitt, Hall, Thayer. When I take a look at the chromosome browser, it's interesting that there's, there's on the browser, there's only a single segment, really, that is showing up. This is quite different from the second to fourth cousin that we saw with Jean and Beverly, where they had segments matching on several chromosomes. In this case, we have just one chromosome that appears to have a matching segment. So Christina looked back in her family tree, and she felt that she had found a match. But it was way back here with uh, Richard and Ursula Thayer. And that is uh, counting back 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 generations back. Now, when I traced David's uh, link to uh, Richard and Ursula, it was also 13 generations. That's 25 degrees of separation. And I felt compelled to do the math on this. Um, so the expected match would be less than a centimorgan, significantly less than a centimorgan. So it really is suggesting that we really aren't going to see matches that old, are we? We have 61 centimorgans, 17 centimorgans in one long block. Now looking at Blaine Bettinger's chart, here we have an exploded view of this narrow section back here where you have very small amount of shared uh, DNA. You can see this would be about 61 where uh, David and Christina match. And so you can see he's seeing a range of results from, you know, second cousins to fifth cousins in there. So we get into this issue, this question of, we have this identical segment, this long identical segment, but how is it identical? And there are three categories of identical that geneticists look at. One is identical by descent. That is that we share that common segment through descent from a single common ancestor. Another possibility is the identical by chance, that it's just a random chance. A third is identical by population, and this is particularly common in uh, Ashkenazi Jewish populations, which were isolated from the larger communities in which they lived for generations. And so there's uh, a lot of shared DNA in the population as a consequence because it was so um, tightly intermarried. Now, when I went to the family search family tree, and looked for the relationship between David and Christina, I found actually another match um, through Thomas, John Thomas Wakefield and his wife Mary Saucon. But again, it, it's way back there. And so I, you know, I'm torn on this one. This is an area where I just don't have enough experience yet to know what I'm looking at. Um, I would expect to have a distant relationship because 
there is only one chromosome with a significant match. On the other hand, I would expect that the relationship would be closer because it's such a long segment. So I'm wondering, there's a couple of possibilities. One is that the, if you'll notice that we have these families living in a fairly narrow area of Massachusetts, is there somehow a close community where we have a case of identical by uh, population? Or more likely is that we have somewhere in here a non-paternity event. That is, our documenting, our documents show David being the son of William, the son of Henrietta, the son of Flor, uh, daughter of Florence, but there may be a non-paternity relationship here that the documentation does not reflect. And that's something that we have to be aware of as we're doing our DNA testing, that sometimes you discover some family secrets. I understand that the rate of non-paternity events tend to be on average 1 to 3 percent per generation and that compounds with generations. So when you're looking at 13 generations of uh, descent, you can be pretty sure that there's probably that there's a very large likelihood that there is a non-paternity event in there. So the further back in time you go, the more you have to question that. Now the reason a non-paternity event becomes a particular issue in this case is because when I looked at Christina's family tree, I saw these same locations, brain tree, Taunton, Massachusetts. So, something to think about. This is just a bit of a taste to get you started to continue learning more about DNA testing and how it relates to genealogy. Blaine Bettinger's blog at thegeneticgenealogist.com is an excellent place to start. And there are some wonderful articles on the wiki at the International Society of Genealogy, isogg.org. Talk to you again soon.